Welcome back to Black News Tonight. Republicans have been on the offensive against concepts like critical race theory and white privilege, concepts that they believe attack fundamental American values, patriotism, and ultimately against freedom of speech and expression. In fact, there's a new cheat sheet making its rounds in conservative circles. Fortunately, we at BNC got our hands on it. It was made by a trio of authors from the Oregon Association of Scholars. Uh, it was recently published and it was made for policymakers and it was entitled Responding to Social Justice Rhetoric. It identifies 12 social justice terms and describes their quote, intended and true meanings as understood by the authors, of course. So, for example, when they say systemic racism, this is their words, what they mean is differences are always due to systems, which is an attribution of group differences to vague, quote unquote, systems imposed by others and an attempt to dismantle freedoms and forcibly redistribute public and private goods. That's a heck of a interpretation. And that's why we're very excited to have our guests on who will talk about why they believe social justice rhetoric curtails freedom of speech and diversity of thought. I have with me now two of the three authors of the cheat sheet, doctors Peter Bogassian and James Lindsay. Thank you both for joining me. Let's just get right to it. How does social justice rhetoric curtail freedom of speech? Well, the rhetoric around social justice itself doesn't necessarily curtail anything, but the application of that rhetoric is very chilling. It leads people to believe that they're going to be accused of participating and su supporting or, or being complicit in racism, sexism, misogyny, et cetera, for voicing views that differ from the views of the people who forward what is known as critical social justice specifically, which is just one of many approaches to social justice uh, in the understanding of making things more fair and, and uh, less discriminatory and prejudiced in society. Can you give me an example of that, of something that, that, that curbs freedom of speech? Yeah, sure. Like, for example, we're not allowed to call the thing we plug into our computer anymore a, a master drive, or we're not allowed to talk about a master bedroom or a master bathroom because it can sometimes make some people feel as though that those words are somehow connected to slavery, even though that's not the case. And so some people can then say, well, that word makes me feel uncomfortable. And then I, I don't want to have that at work. So you see major corporations, for example, deciding, well, we're not going to use the terms like master slave drive or master bedroom being struck down from uh, realtor websites, for example. And if you don't know, by the way, the master bedroom term originated in a Sears catalog in 1929, which is quite a long time after slavery ended. So it wasn't actually connected to that. That turns out to be a, a legend. Uh, and not even real, but you can see how being accused of racism is leading even significant corporations to back off from using that language. So the curtailing of the willingness to speak is certainly present within within that ideology. So let, let me push back against that. And, and, and Peter, would you jump in as Please. well? I mean, it, it doesn't sound to me as if this is curbing free speech, it's simply imposing consequences on free speech, uh, and there have always been consequences on free speech. If I, for example, continue to say a master-slave relationship with disk drives, right, which we all used to do, at least back in the day when we actually had disk drives, um, and, so, and make someone uneasy, they may respond differently. If I continue to sell my, my bedroom furniture as master bedroom furniture, um, and people say, well, you know, it makes us uneasy, and so we don't want to sell it here. These are, con are market-based consequences, but people have a right to still do it. it. It seems to me that sometimes the right makes it make, conflates two things. They take consequences and accountability and they conflate it with freedom. They act as if because people respond to their words or respond to their actions in particular ways, that they're no longer free to do it. Okay, so there are two principles. There is the philosophical principle of free speech and then there is the legal principle of free speech. And so you're, you're appealing to the legal principle, which is of course upheld, except that um, the problem becomes that the philosophical notion of free speech, the, the idea that somebody's gonna be able to speak without consequences is of course ridiculous. But the idea that somebody's going to be able to speak without having to risk losing their job or losing their standing in society for something that is actually fairly benign, for example, brown bag lunch. It's a completely uh, benign thing or a thing that nobody even seems to know 
has a uh, not even really racist connotation in its past from over 100 years ago, long time no see, which is a direct translation from the Chinese. The idea that we're going to chill the way that people speak and that they can then lead to situations in which they're being mobbed on social media and losing their livelihood because they don't necessarily have free speech under their employer, uh, that's a really concerning development in society. And it's one that we actually should be taking seriously, especially since we're having extremism stand downs, for example, in the US military. And we're seeing this kind of stuff taught in schools, which is being done by the state. And one of the, if I may, so, Mark, piggyback please, off of that. Please. Um, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. One of the reasons that we made this, and I, I genuinely thank you for reaching out to us, is to make ease of translation. And so the first author, I wish he could be here with us tonight, is Bruce Gilley. And a very quick correction from the beginning of the segment. Uh, I am not a member of the Oregon Association of Scholars, neither is Dr. Dr. Lindsay, it's just Dr. Gilley. One of the reasons that we made this cheat sheet was for policymakers, so when they heard a certain term, they could translate it into another term in their head so they could understand what people are actually saying, given that the meanings of these words have changed significantly. So, and again, I, so I have I have a couple of, of, of pushbacks here. The first one to the to the, the, the latter point or the former point, rather, which is, you know, again, there have always been consequences to behavior. People have always lost their jobs for things that they've said. The difference is now in the 21st century, there's a movement to say, look, things that can get you fired aren't just things that harm certain groups of people, but things that may do harm to other groups of people. Now suddenly race is in the conversation. Trans folk are in the conversation. Women are in the conversation. Uh, issues around Excuse ability me, status Mark, are the in the conversation. Folk. The word folk makes me uncomfortable. The word folk comes from the Herdarian Which, nationalism. The word folk that you just used makes me uncomfortable. Oh, the word that folk, I'm sorry. Herder. Yeah, that See, comes from Herder, which was a German nationalist. It, he used it with a spell with a V, but it's pronounced folk, right? And he had a strong German nationalist streak. And he, uh, his, his, his ideology about nationalism and folkish ideology led to some pretty bad things in the early 20th century. And I'm kind of uncomfortable with you using that word. So should your speech now be curtailed? Because I'm uncomfortable with the word folk. Yeah. In Jim, this context. Jim, if you don't mind me calling it you. should? Jim, if you don't mind Please me calling you, Jim. Jim. I, uh, I, I, I would say um, I received that. I own that. Mm -hmm. I deeply apologize for it. If there's a way that I can restore, or engage in a restorative act to make you feel better about it, I would happily do so. I don't so. need a restorative act. Um, I'm just telling and, uh, you that you should know the history of the word that you're using. I agree. I'm agreeing with you. I'm saying I should. And if there's something I can do to make sure that other people know it, I'm happy to do that as well. I, I think that that is exactly what we should do when, we, when our words go Folkish, I S H, but folkish, the German folkish. Do you know where the, the ideology went in Germany? You know where that led to? Right. So again, Germany, the example that you're getting, just so just yeah. so that we don't get too just so we don't get too far down this rabbit hole. I'm saying, in the in, in, with what you're saying, I'm saying this is exactly what I what at least what I would argue should happen. You should point something out. I should be able to respond to it, and even though you're doing it somewhat tongue in cheek potentially. I'll, I, I, but I'll I'll, I'll 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 presume that you're doing this in good faith. I would say I would happily I would happily change my speech and model it for other people. And that's the problem is that somehow when the left does that toward the right or toward white people around race or toward men around gender, we often don't want to do that. And that's where it gets very, very, uh, very, very troublesome for me. Uh, but the, the second issue that I have here and, and we can talk about I'm going I'm to hold you guys over because I'd love to finish this conversation um, is that some of the ways that you all are representing how social justice rhetoric to you is being used, um, I think is inaccurate. There's ways that you all are, are framing this that are almost caricatures of what people are actually saying in progressive circles. So I don't want to I don't want to so throw one out there and make, me, you go to, make people wait. So let, let, no, let, let me just I, pause here I, just I, so we can take a commercial break. Uh, okay. Okay. And then you can come back and we can have the whole conversation. I just don't want to cut you off. I want to give you a, a full sentence. Everybody stay Thank with you. us. I have some great people. I said people here with me. <laughs> and we're going to have a great conversation with these human beings. Stay with <laughs> us. Welcome back to Black News Tonight. I've been having a wonderful conversation here around these questions of rhetoric, this question of language when it comes to social justice. And I have two guests here, Peter Bagazian and, and James Lindsay, who have been uh, engaging me in a, in a conversation about whether or not these are legitimate spaces 
uh, to engage, or, or, or rather, what, le what what legitimate engagement looks like with questions of social justice language. So I want to keep I want to keep the conversation going. Peter, you were you were going to say something. I wanted to give you an opportunity. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you. I I appreciate that. So when Jim said that and you s gave your response, I would like to give the identical response that you gave to our sheet. So if there's something that's unfair or we've mischaracterized something, I'd invite people to, to tell us and to have that conversation with us. And we're completely willing to revise or revamp. In fact, we've said repeatedly that this is a first iteration. And if you go to the site, actually Jim's site, New Discourses, um, and you can call me Pete or Peter, either one. If you go to New, New Discourses, you can see each of those words are sourced within the social justice literature. So we didn't just invent this stuff. We took the words as they were used from the social justice literature. And if we've made a mistake, then I'll fully apologize for that and revise accordingly. All right, so let's look at a couple of the things here. This, this, this is one of the things that I find interesting. So under systemic racism, you say when, when people, progressives, I'm just gonna use progressives if you don't mind. When you say pro progressives say, uh, or social justice folk, people, excuse me, uh, say differences uh, are always due to systems, right? That's not the right. argument. When we say that there's systemic racism, the argument has never been that every th single thing that happens in the world is due to systems. There's always been a relationship between structures or systems and agency, human action. And, the, and all of the research literature, all the philosophy, all the theory has been about trying to find a, a balance and trying to make sense of the relationship between those two things. We're not robots walking through the world. We, we have choices, we have options. No, no, no race theorist argues that we don't. And so the idea here that systemic racism is just some kind of institutional blame game, I think, becomes a kind of caricature of it. Uh, I'm gonna say one more and then I, I wanna give you two a chance uh, to, to respond here. Um, you said that critical race theory says that is the view that all disparities in group outcomes are due to racist systems, right? Again, no, I mean, one of the most enduring, if not the most enduring term from critical race theory has been intersectionality. And so when we look at uh, people like Kimberly Crenshaw and others who talk about the intersections of race and gender and geography and ability status, I think it'd be ho it's wholly inaccurate to suggest that everything, even in critical race theory, is chalked up to race. How would you respond to those two criticisms? I mean, the intersectionality one's actually very easy to, to respond to. Yeah, of course, she's talking about other intersecting systems of power, but all of these systems of power are said to work the same way. And you mentioned structural, so I'm very glad you did that because um, structural refers to, in this case, one of two things, language as in structuralism, as in as interpreted through postmodernism, which means that we are actually products of our, contingent products of our, of our culture and times, which therefore means that we don't actually have agency that because we are actually just socialized into the conditions that we're in and we mistake that which we think is uh, is true uh, when it's actually just manifestations of those systems of power. Uh, it's also can refer to the structures of society in a Marxian superstructure way, like Karl Marx, as put forth, say, by Herbert Marcuse in the 1960s, father of the new left, who talked about the fact that everybody who doesn't have a critical awakened consciousness, in other words, everybody who's not a critical theorist, whether it's critical race, critical gender, critical queer, critical disability, critical fat, whatever you want to have it, is actually just being influenced in his thought through the heteronymous interests of corporate capitalism and, cor uh, and, and uh, consumerism and the various systems of power, including racism, sexism, et cetera, that manifest throughout society. So actually we don't have agency under critical race theory or any of its philosophical correct. antecedents. That's correct. They so claim that you I wish we had more time to, to unpack your critical theorist, which is an incredible irony because you actually have to sacrifice all of your agency to think otherwise, which is how it chills freedom of thought and freedom of speech, because you have to be critically conscious or else you have false consciousness and are therefore not acting out yourself. You have no actual agency. Okay, so, and it, of course we're running out of time, but I'm gonna respond just so the audience and the people who watch this on clips don't think that Please. I don't have a response. First of all, sure, sure. The, 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 your, your counter is predicated on the idea that there's a one-to-one -one relationship between critical race theory and critical theory as sort of produced from the Marxist tradition, from the Frankfurt School, et cetera, when in fact, critical race theory has certainly connections to any kind of critical uh, intellectual discourse, but it's also connected to critical legal studies, which was not committed mm -hmm. to sort of inheriting all of the, all of the kind of uh, 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 Gramscian and Marxian sort of ideas that you're talking about. 
And again, Correct. even the type of Marxism you're talking about is a very narrow, thin sort of crude Marxism, or even what we call vulgar Marxism, which uh, alleges a relationship between economic base and cultural superstructure that is one to one, when in fact, what most Marxists have argued, and what certainly most Marxists post uh, the, the mid part of the 20th century have argued, is that it's a much more complicated dynamic than even Gramsci himself argues that in the prison notebooks about this idea of hegemony and how it happens along a compromise equilibrium, whereby some people, or, or, or whereby on the one hand, we absolutely are, 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 are hostage to the economic conditions around us, but on the other hand, uh, structures and states and institutions also appeal to our own desires and, and our own interests and our own needs. It's a much more dynamic and complicated relationship than you're talking about. And as far as sort of structures, that, the, the, again, you're, you're making a connection between structures in terms of institutional structures that I was talking about and the particular type of structures that, say, a Saussure would be talking about in terms of structuralism. That's not actually what I was talking about. And that's not what most people are talking about when they talk about systems and structures. Again, that's a very tight correlation you draw. But and if we were to accept that correlation, then sure. But it's not only that we're not accepting it, it's actually not what we're talking about. And postmodernism, yeah, again, plays upon actually. a range of things. I'm sorry? I said you know a lot about this, actually. That you know a very, you know yeah, a very I, large amount about this, very much detail. And so I have a question for you then. Do you accept, for example, in Critical Race Theory and Introduction, which is a pretty standard textbook in the subject, I think you would agree, do you accept where they have an entire yeah. section and part of a chapter dedicated to the idea that there is structural determinism along the structure of racism? Do you believe in structural determinism, which is a core assumption of critical race theory? That the structures themselves um, determine question. outcomes based on race? Structures shape outcomes. They overdetermine outcomes. They inform outcomes, but they do not, they do, they do not uh, predetermine outcomes in such a way that we have no power, that we have no ability to change systems or structures. If that were the case, then we would have a very predictable, what we would sort of uh, a pathway towards some ultimate telos, some ultimate end in sight. In other words, I believe that human beings have the capacity to change and shift and push back and reimagine and reshape. And that's what uh, I think your analysis doesn't do. We got way more academic than I wanted to for this audience. But unfortunately, if I don't respond in that way, then the audience will assume that I can't. So I'm going to bring you all back so we can have a much longer conversation about this. And maybe we can do it in some other spaces where we can really dig down and drill down into this a lot. Um, Peter and James, thank you so much for joining me. Stay with us, everybody. We thank got you. much more Black News tonight coming up right after this. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.